This is Off Planet Radio. There we go. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I am Emily Moyer, and tonight's a treat because you get both of us. You get Randy as well. And uh, we're finally getting to uh, do a show that he and I have been talking about for probably over a year now, or at least a, about a year. Uh, and uh, we were planning to do it a few months back, but um, all previously uh, planned programming seems to <laughs> have been upended by the current situation. And we felt there was a few shows that were important to do uh, during this time. We're not usually as concerned with time sensitive material as things have been in the last few uh, weeks and months. But uh, you know, I think the shows with David Martin and some and Sonia and whatnot were important to do. So this got pushed back a little bit, but tonight we are gonna sit down and get her done. So um, Randy. Good to be with you again, buddy. Yeah, thanks. Um, good intro. Um, so we're going to talk about specifically the books around the Transylvania Sunrise series, but we're going to focus on this one here, Inside the Earth. And <laughs> this is um, the second tunnel. So map out. let me map out a little bit about, about the, the series that, is woven around these books. Um, this saga goes back, mm, let's see, almost 20 years uh, with the discovery of the, of the underground temple in the Bugacci Mountains of um, what's called Transylvania in Romania. Um, the particular cavern that was discovered primarily was detected <clears throat> by um, satellite surveillance from the Pentagon and located underneath the Romanian Sphinx, which is a very interesting structure that um, it's, it's been argued whether it's natural or whether it's been somehow hewn. And uh, I actually work with somebody from Romania who's told me who's been there She's been into the mountains there and said that the formation itself is creepy because it looks from all accounts to be very natural, but yet at the same time, um, there's something about it that has the fingerprint of design in it. And if you look at it, it looks like it's very weathered and worn. So they call that the, um, the Romanian Sphinx. And so going back to probably the early 2000s, uh, there was an alert that went out through intelligence and military channels about the presence of this um, very large cavern underneath the Romanian Sphinx. And <clears throat> this began a convergence into uh, Romania through U.S. military and intelligence channels, largely, I think, through the Army and the Navy. So, hey, Randy, I just wanted, before we kind of dig into this, say that I remember you doing a show on the first book in this series many, many years ago. Um, I think it was on the Transylvanian Sunrise, right? I think which was the first book in the series. That's the first and, book, yeah. Yeah, and I rem and this was long before you and I knew each other or worked together. And I remember sitting in my apartment and listening to you and just thinking, wow, dude, like talk about like that sort of, that sweet spot, that interface of like natural, you know, sort of biology, biological technologies, right? Sort of like interdimensional, you know, and there's a technological component to it and a natural organic biological component to it. And it's individualized based on the experiencer. And I was just fascinated by, by that conversation. I, I think you were just talking about it yourself or you weren't interviewing somebody, were you? No, I you never. You were just talking about it, yeah. Right. No, I never interviewed anyone over. The only person yeah. we theoretically could have gotten to interview would be Peter Moon, and um, he's not available right now. Um, 
but Peter Moon is the publisher of these books. And Peter Moon, obviously, if you don't know who he is, he is the author with Preston Nichols of the Montauk Project, Experiments in Time, which was published back in 1992. And he's kind of carved out this, this niche inside of the community connected to Montauk and a lot of other projects. Um, the, the books are, to describe these books is very difficult unless you've read them. They are paranormal thrillers. I mean, you could make films out of these. This is a huge, huge piece of work that um, is written in the form of fiction largely to protect what's actually in it. And what's actually in these books is very much in the realm of what you would call deep occult knowledge. Uh, the first book is really begins to set the stage for what occurs throughout all of the other books and the story of the tunnel itself and the projection room that's inside of the uh, main chamber. This, this, this chamber, to describe it, is completely hollowed out of a mountain. The walls of it are like glass. I'm going to see if I can pull up a picture of the, that people have, someone drew, I think, that I saw one time. Keep talking. And inside of it are numerous chambers that uh, one includes what's called the projection room, which actually has a holographic projector that in the narrative is described as having been programmed and placed inside of this projection room tens of thousands of years ago. And the projection room itself has a console and a giant viewing screen. And Radu Cinema and um, let me just go through, there's a couple of characters here that will be, as we go through this, we'll introduce people. The two main characters are uh, Radu Cinemar, who's the author, and then Cesar Brad, who is the head now of what's called Department Zero, which is the uh, Romanian government's paranormal, it's X-Files group, basically. So the projection room is described as being this console with this viewing screen where you can go back and look at history. And they describe various events that they viewed, including the crucifixion of Jesus. So it's a very interesting tableau in how it breaks out what you would call deep occult um, technology of, let's just say, not of this world origin. Absolutely. I can't find the picture. I, I had seen some sort of artistic rendering of what it looked like at one time, and I can find the article that I saw it in, but it looks like the picture or the video is gone. Yeah, um, I, I, well, maybe we'll drop some of these in in post-production. Okay. Because uh, there are, there are um, some graphics inside of the books themselves. Yeah. Um, so... But uh, basically, the, the Transylvania series is connected to underground facilities, defense activities, and the metaphysics behind the hidden realms that basically literally sit under our feet. We've been talking about these things for a long time. Uh, almost everybody that we've talked to who comes from a project discusses the, the presence of underground bases, underground facilities. Montauk, obviously Camp Hero, is probably one of the best known in terms of having been published about for a long time. There's a number of people out there who have discussed the Montauk projects. Chris Holly and I used to go into a lot of this because Chris, Chris literally lived on Long Island and uh, had uh, a lot of connections to Montauk herself. Uh, this is an interesting side story. We had a group of people connected to Chris Holly, who were all experiencers. These were real, this was called the real timers group. This was a group of women who experienced, this is a, this is a side trail story, but. We love side trails. <laughs> uh, so these four, there were four women that I knew of and one with whom I had contact with, but they were what were called the real timers. They were people who had lifelong experiences abductions out of time, out of body. Um, there were also people who, like Chris, were very gifted. All of them were entrepreneurs, self-sustaining, very inventive. 
And um, in the course of doing some background work, one of them contacted Chris and said that they had identified me from Montauk, which I have no memories of. Again, it's another one of those things out of time that don't make sense, but they fingered me as being one of them. So for what that's worth, there is connections to Montauk, even within my personal accounting, in terms of memories that I have, but don't know specifically where they're from. And that's kind of some of the stuff that we'll get into in the second segment. So uh, if anybody out there has studied this at all, you probably know who Duncan Cameron is and Al Bielek. Al Bielek wrote about the Philadelphia Project, which was also connected to Montauk. So you have a lot of project kids who were part of the experiments and simulations that take place under deep state military operations. And this has gone on for, you know, about the last 40 years that we can account for and probably 70 or longer. But really, once you get into uncovering, <laughs> pun intended, uncovering <laughs> what goes on under the ground, you realize that it's been going on for a really long time. And of course, inside the earth, it really gets real when you start to understand that um, we, we constitute a tiny sliver of what really goes on in this world and describing what this world is, this, this earth. So what becomes even more interesting is the way these books break out metaphysics, mm -hmm. um, paranormal experiences, and science itself. Uh, these books deeply will challenge your perceptions um, on just about everything that you believe you know about how the world works. And it is very much um, a probe into how what you would call alien civilizations have worked to develop resources and how there are literally worlds within the Earth's structure. In other words, when we begin to go through this, you begin to understand that Earth is a multi-layered, nested reality. It's far more vast and unexplored. And I've been saying this forever. It's far more vast and unexplored than the mythical space that sits above us that everybody keeps wanting to talk about going to. Um, this is all linked to time. It's all linked to uh, dimensional rifts and vortexes and portals the grand expanse of these seven books and i should just point out the transylvania sunrise was first published in romania in 2002 and that's kind of how we arrive at the events in bugetchi probably happened in the late 90s um, my guess would be that the discovery of this 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 facility or whatever this is probably coincided with the fall of Ceausescu on Ceausescu, a certain level yeah. and the overturning of communism in the whole eastern part of Europe. So when did Ceausescu fall? He fell in the eighties, didn't he? Yeah, well, I think the, the the entire like thing that happened where all I mean, the they executed that whole they took Ceausescu and his whole family out and shot him in the head. The th but the thing that like, that happened in the eighties, but then the the. Um, transition of Romania, the Soviet Union, all right, those Eastern right. Bloc countries from communist to not happened in the early 90s. I remember like it was during the period of time about the 19, just like, I think it happened in like 1990, 91, because in 1992, like the Soviet Union was competing in the Olympics as the unified team. The, the Berlin Wall came down in what, 1989? 89. And 1989. then I think that the Soviet Union and Romania fell in like 90 or 91 yeah. in terms of communism. And yeah. see, there always was this tension with Romania. And I have this confirmed, you know, by <clears throat> my co-worker who grew up in Romania that um, they didn't trust Russia. Mm -hmm. And so their most natural ally actually was China, mm -hmm. communist China then, red China. Mm -hmm. And that actually is a thread that runs through these books as well because of the mystical nature of a certain key figure in the book. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the other figures in the book 
and probably one of the most important because he is he's he's informing narratives. The way these books are written, they're written on a number. These books are written on a number of levels. They are an adventure story. They have a plot. They have characters. They have backdrops. They have action. But what they also have within them are what you will call narratives. And in some ways, the style of these books reminds me very much in a very good way of Ayn Rand's work. Because within the books themselves, there are entire dialogues, monologues that occur that unpack a lot of information. Well, so this, there's, all, there's also little lessons, like in, in all of Ayn Rand's books, there were sort of lessons on architecture and lessons sure. on, on railroad building. And in here, there's lessons on physics and metaphysics. So you might like leave the general narrative or story for 20 or 30 pages to have the, the charts and the physics of the different layers of what's going on explained to you as kind of like an aside. Here's your lesson so you can understand the rest of the story, just as, as in Ayn Rand. Yeah. Yeah. So in the first book, um, what gets unpacked is the central character next to Radimar, Radu Cinemar, it says our Brad, who is the head of this department zero. And it begins with the story of the birth of Cesar Brad, because he was born with what they described as an extraordinarily long umbilical cord that literally had to be hacked with a surgical blade to cut it. Um, this resulted in the doctors immediately notifying the, uh, the intelligence agencies or what became Department Zero, which was at that time had been organized under Ceausescu. Mm -hmm. And um, so the story of Cesar Brad is actually the, the formative part of the first book because Cesar Brad is described as he's growing up as being this prodigy. At one point, um, he's described as sitting in his bedroom as probably a 10-year-old child meditating and levitating. Mm -hmm. So that's the extraordinary level that you're dealing with. And Cesar Brad delivers a lot of the, what you would call the narratives, the monologues that give you a lot of deep, knowledge. Um, he unpacks metaphysics, he unpacks political intrigue, obviously very up on the operations of, of international intelligence. He's a central figure in, as a liaison between the Pentagon and um, the military and intelligence services in Romania. And he appears to have an extraordinarily high level of spiritual development. One yeah. of the central themes that run through all of this is consciousness and vibration. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I mean, these, these books are, um, for me, when, like, you know, I remember hearing you talk about it. I haven't read the entire series. I just read this book uh, on recommendation of Sonia and then realized that this was connected to the book that you had done the show on so many years ago. Um, and I thought about going back and reading the whole series, but it did say in this book that you could read this one you alone. Can, you can. You could read it alone. Um, for me, it was this, like, it, it was like a relief, right? Everything that it was saying in this book made perfect sense to me, right? I do struggle with some of the talk about, you know, how you're proving things about, you know, the Cavendish experiment and this and that and whatever. But in terms of what it says about frequency and consciousness and spirituality and resonance and all that kind of stuff, this basically confirmed for me all of the things that I know from my experiences, from our conversations to be true um, in a way that uh, also made sense scientifically, like obviously, you know, on a certain level. Um, so yeah, the, the, the interesting thing about these books is if you are of a certain mindset, that would be the people who will listen and watch to watch these shows because they get it. You begin to see reflected back to you in very real terms, a lot of the things that we have suspected or that we kind of knew inside. And especially when it comes to paranormal things and specifically certain scientific principles that that really just collapse the entire 
modern scientific world in, in understanding advanced physics, but really physics and metaphysics kind of merge in this. So I'll just point out there, there are seven books in the series. Inside the Earth is book six. I am presently reading book seven, which is Forgotten Genesis, which is oh. interesting. There's so many connections. It's interesting because we've also talked in the past about the uh, Genesis Antarctica book. Mm -hmm. And all of this, there's connections to all of this. Um, the more I have gone through this material and the longer that I've researched this particular area of metaphysics and paranormal, I've just seen tremendous overlaps in things that are presented largely as fiction again, because they have to present it as fiction in order to, let's just say, protect the disclosure that's taking place. Fiction's mm -hmm. a great way to protect mm -hmm. disclosure. So one of the other figures that goes into this narrative, and he's pivotal because he shows up in interesting places and interesting times, is a man named Dr. David Lewis Anderson, who is the founder of the Anderson Institute. Anderson is a real world scientist engineer. He's worked with, this, with NASA. He's done work uh, in, the, in the field of satellites, uh, doing what he calls time control technologies. And the interesting thing about it, Anderson shows up right inside of the first page of the first book when uh, Peter Moon introduces him. And let me just, just pull this up here. Sorry for the pages flapping. But this is kind of tying this, tying this together with David, David Anderson, because what we're doing is we're tying threads together. Yep. And now I can't find See, it. See, David Anderson has come up, I believe, in our the lengthy interview we did with uh, Andrew Bashago, as well as the series that we did with Cliff High. Yeah. Was, yeah. So just to say it, Peter Moon dedicates the first uh, the first edition of Transylvania Sunrise to David Anderson. What a lot of people may not know. What is interesting to me is that Anderson also figures into the Wingmakers. And anybody that's followed this show for a long time knows that I am very interested in the Wingmakers' work. And um, going back to interviewing um, the, the webmaster of, of the, the Wingmakers site years ago, doing two interviews with him. I remember, yeah. And... Um, can you just, I, I listened to those interviews you did with, with him, right? But I was whole, completely unfamiliar with the Wingmakers material. And while I hear it refer, ref, like referred to, you know, quite a bit uh, for a period of time, like, I don't know that I've ever had a, a holistic understanding of, of what it is. In well, like, like Transylvania, like the Transylvania um, series, it's based on the discovery of a, a series of chambers inside of mountains in, gosh, I get to, I, I'm not sure if it was tr if it was New Mexico or Arizona. Somebody can correct me on this because I don't think I have this information. Okay. Um, the story of the Wingmakers is basically detailed on the Wingmakers website. The, there were no books published. There have been books published since. The Wingmakers material has been on the internet since 1998. And again, the same era, this time space mm -hmm. that starts in like the 70s mm -hmm. and moves through the 90s into the 2000s, there was something going on with these sites that were being uncovered in this period of time. They inevitably wind up being taken over by the spooks mm -hmm. for the most part. Sometimes the good spooks and sometimes the bad spooks. David Anderson seems to be one of these figures that walks between the worlds of intelligence and science in mm -hmm. some very interesting ways. He's highly respected. He is deeply mysterious. Uh, he's, he's known to disappear. Disappears for very, a lot, yeah. Disappears for long periods of time, yeah. And 
um, then just shows up somewhere again and apparently runs the Anderson Institute and other facilities around the world, which tie into, again, Romania, because Romania is of extreme interest in terms of what you would call time technology. So the Wingmakers material, you can go to wingmakers.com. I'll put some, I'll put some links up with the show because I have them here in my show notes. And you can, this is deep material. I mean, you could spend, a, you could spend a good year just reading the material on the Wingmakers website. Um, I've read three of the books that have been published as a result of the Wingmakers. I have read most of the website at various times. I've talked to Mark Hempel, who was the designer and programmer for the Wingmakers material. I have the music CDs. I'm sort of a Wingmakers fanatic. Yeah, I remember, yeah. The artwork is incredible, and it speaks to you. And it's so it's, it's very unique because it has this kind of, I don't know, uh, Mesoamerica motif to it. I mean, it's sort of steeped in something that feels like it comes from the period of the Aztecs. And yet at the same time, it feels modern. It's yeah. weird. So, the, but what happened was, in the, in, at the wing, in the Wingmakers site, I don't want to protract this, but it does tie in. And it's, the Wingmakers site was eventually uncovered that there were 23 chambers. Now, 23 is an interesting number because that's the number of chromosomes of DNA. Yep. Um, in the 23rd chamber, they found an optical code disk. Now, you will find the same motif inside of inside the earth mm -hmm. in fact um several of the transylvania series books talk about uh data that's encrypted in some sort of optical substrate or crystalline material that has a holographic nature to it mm -hmm. and this ties in again to david anderson because anderson was involved in the original site recovery and he also decoded a lot of the optical disk that was found in the 23rd chamber, which was the mother lobe from which the Wingmakers material is legendarily carved out of. It, there's an interview, and I'll put a link up with this, um, with David Anderson, where he's discussing what's called blank slate technology, which is a form of time travel and remote viewing that enables rewrites of history. Hmm. via what he calls intervention points. That's kind of interesting because that goes into um, holographic kinetics too. It goes into holographic kinetics. It goes into ideas of reset. Yeah. It goes into ideas about Mandela effect and it goes to what we're at right now. Yeah. Right. What so, you're saying, what you're saying right now about the 23 chambers is kind of interesting as well. You know, one of the, Bit, the like the main points and bases of this book is that uh, the inside of the earth is a hollow is hollow it's a black hole right that there is a black hole in the inside of the earth and we just started reading a book called the gene keys by a guy named Richard Rudd right who mm -hmm. basically is implying so, like is a lot of similar kinds of things in a different way but he talks about our DNA actually being a wormhole right so this would be connecting these ideas that way as well right and you've done a lot of research on dna as of i many years ago and i had referred to it at one point i think as like a time travel device right and that would connect in this way to that as well what you were saying 23 chromosomes or 23 chambers and then as far as the optical disc goes this is just bringing up for me as well we've talked a lot about the eyes on this show that the pupil is a black hole and that so many kids who are in projects have these eyes that have the central heterochromia to them right that are slightly different and i'm curious as to if some of these kinds of optical discs or crystals with embedded information are uh, more readable by people with a particular kind of eyes. And we've talked about that as, you know, something that had, was being searched for, right? I mean, obviously, what you said also something a few, little bit ago about uh, this time period between the 70s, right, and the 90s where things started to shift. And we've talked about, I think this goes all the way back to conversations like with Z, right, in terms of like, they're selecting people for projects and programs based on the frequency and they're tracking those frequencies even before 
sort of, you know, children come in, right? And if, they, if that's the period of time when they're discovering these chambers or these areas that you have to have a certain resonance in order to penetrate through them, then that could explain a lot about what they were looking for, right? They were looking for somebody with the vibration or with some sort of something in their genetics that allowed access to areas that were not, uh, not accessible to just your general Joe Schmo from the military or from the government or, or whatever, right? So I, I think a lot of that goes into even the concepts of um, soul incarnations yep. and the fact that some of us have, have, have been traveling for a long time. <laughs> and um, obviously we don't have recall of that, although we have you know, occasional things that come up to the surface. Our consciousness in this realm is very restricted to this time space domain that we occupy. But I've long held that we were profiled coming in. They knew who we are. That's how they targeted people who they brought into projects. That's how they located. That's what that was the whole point of Project Talent. Yep. And Project Talent basically um, leveraged the assets of the Second World War because one of the benefits of the Second World War was the rollout of computers, mm -hmm. largely the early IBM mainframes. Genetic profiling. But beginning in the 40s, the military began keeping extremely good records of what passed through their inventory. And that's a very deliberate term. <laughs> um, they were very aware that as these men came through, they had access to their blood types, they had access to family history. They had access to everything about them physically, mentally, psychologically, because when you go into the military, all of that stuff is aggregated into data. So from the 40s forward, they built a comprehensive database. Now, on the Earth realm, there's that. And then there's the Akashic Records and the probable futures database that we've talked about mm -hmm. in the in the eye of the needle series which is the holographic version of the ibm mainframe with the uh, the punch cards and the magnetic tape so that they know they know where their assets are and they know when they're coming in this is soul profiling mm -hmm. and actually the transylvania books hint on this they hint on it early with cesar brad that Clearly, they were expecting him, mm -hmm. and he was identified by something that was very specific. Mm -hmm. So, and this all, there's so much connective material in all of this, but especially between inside inside the Earth, the Transylvania books, and uh, the Wingmakers material. It's just fascinating how much overlap there is. I love when that happens because you get the little missing links to the narrative. You know what I mean? Like this came a few years later than the Wingmakers material and it filled in some, you know, some nice little spots and slots. But you hadn't actually, we hadn't, you and I hadn't really talked about the connection between that until now. So that's interesting. I remember those shows. So, all right. So where did you want to go next? You had a lot of stuff in your notes here that was interesting. But David, David Anderson is probably one of the most mysterious characters in all of this period for me, like the, even this aside, like, you know, I didn't know until I read this book that he figured into this as well, but he's been super elusive in terms of um, like really being able to get a good understanding of what this person is really about. Right. And what it is he actually is doing. Right? He's probably one of the most mysterious yeah. figures we know of in the world yeah and largely unknown to the general public but to those of us in this particular realm he's he's kind of known peter he's, moon knows him very well and he's a very real character yeah and it's not an accident that he shows up in the Wingmakers, and then he shows up in romania as part of this this um uncovering of the um 
chamber it, inside of Bugatti Mountains. It says here in your notes that Anderson is cited as being the head of Labyrinth Group, and that's yep. right. <laughs> that's about the perfect uh, description of sort of you know he, he could he could be the only member and make up the whole group. He's sort of interesting, but and then the member of the ACIO, the Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization. Yeah. A labyrinth group is basically an intelligence, high, high order intelligence group. Yep. I mean, way above, way above anything that we conceive of as above top secret right. or above cosmic, as Bob Dean called it. A labyrinth group are the inside operatives of, you know, probably what you would consider to be MJ-12, mm -hmm. which uh, the other component of that obviously is the ACIO. The ACIO is the alien intelligence side of this the off-world contact. And a lot of this goes into human origins, which is, you know, exactly the point of this seventh book, Forgotten Genesis, which, you know, again, overlaps into the Antarctica book. And, you know, I'll just point out, you know, we'll, we'll put a reading list out with this. Yeah. Anybody who has an interest in these books really wants to take a look at the book Ida Dorba, which is by John Uri Lloyd, published in 1896, 100 years before this shit went down. Ida Dorba confirms a lot of the things that are seen inside the earth in terms of even um, traveling into different levels of the earth what, it, what goes on under the earth in terms of how there are civilizations there, how time works differently, um, the conduction of energy via consciousness. These different, are things life, different, life, different length of life, right? Like the age of yeah. people, right? They, uh... Yeah, in the book Ida Dorpa, the central figure there is he's advanced in age to be a very old man, like, like in his 70s like almost crippled old. And they take him into this entrance where he goes into the cavern to go into the earth. And he's not sure he's even going to make it through this. By the time they're halfway through this journey, he has regressed back to a man of 30 years old. Mm -hmm. So, well, and then some of these characters they, in the, in inside the earth that they meet in the inner realms are sometimes hundreds of years old, but don't appear any older than your average middle aged person. Thousands of years old. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is closer to correct. I mean, it's but you know, like it, Sonia has talked about that on a lot of levels on this program and whatnot. Right, that that we we've been sold a bill of goods about average life length expectancy, <laughs> and then our belief in that has programmed it to happen. Right, the people who have an interest in that need to read the second book, Transylvania Moonrise. Transylvania Moonrise is um, that's a, that's a, that's a very different book than Transylvania Sunrise, in that it moves uh, Radu Cinema into a journey that he takes into Tibet with um, a man called Dr. Zien, who's one of the central characters as well. And what happens in Transylvania Moonrise is that they enter Tibet via a portal and are conducted there by a creature known as a, a Vidam, which is an energetic or physical being created by a sand mandala ritual. That's fascinating. And Go, they go into um, this hidden mountain abode. They meet this blue goddess named Makande. And they then conduct a ritual of initiation into ancient mystical secrets. And the book takes you through a lot of the nuts and bolts of this, including some aspects of longevity, mm -hmm. or what you might call immortality, because it looks as though uh, Makande is, is, is one of the ancients. Interesting. Romania has also long been tied to the idea of immortality. I mean, that's where the legends of Drac Dracula yeah. and Vlad the Impaler and all that kind of stuff, you know, and vampires and whatever comes from. Um, well, Dracula is a derivation of the Drach or mm -hmm. the Draco. Yes. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there's a fictitious, you know, even going back into the, the last two centuries, there has been this disclosure going on in the form of fiction. Fiction mm -hmm. is the greatest form of disclosure. Absolutely. All right. So 
you had a couple more things in your notes that I thought were super interesting. Um, Randy sent me some very detailed notes before we, as we got ready to do this. You talked a little bit about some of the other characters. I don't know if you wanted to get into them about Signor Massini, who doesn't really figure too much in this book. I think he's more of uh, in in some of the other books, although there is Massini, reference yeah. to him. Massini shows up from time to time. He's sort of the sin and the Vaseline kind of character. So who Massini is, is he's an Italian Freemason. He shows up in the first book, and then he shows up uh, in various, various other times. Yes. But he is what we would call the head of the P2 Lodge, the High Lodge in Italy. Mm -hmm. And he is one of the people that's inside of the circle with the discovery of the, of the tunnel under the Romanian Sphinx. Yeah. Uh, he basically has connections deep into the Pentagon, which obviously lots of Masonic connections there. And in um, Transylvania Sunrise, he meets with Cesar Brad, who is the key man at that point. He's not the head of Department Zero. And in that book, this is probably one of the, if you bought this book for no other reason, there is an entire dialogue between Cesar Brad and Massini, who's also, <sighs> Massini is also known as the venerable one. They refer mm -hmm. to him as that. Yeah, he's, re and, he's referred to a few times in, in this book, as, in the Inside the Earth book as well. Yeah. He, so he is like the pain in the ass that you can't get rid of. He has to be dealt with. He wields that much power. So Massini and Cesar Brad, um, in the first book, have this gigantic conversation. It runs, um, what's, runs almost 40 pages, mm -hmm. like, like about 39 pages, where they break down how the control grid works, how the Freemasons work, how business structures are built, how they interlock with military, intelligence, governments, uh, crime, crime syndicates. This is, um, this is very much an Ayn Rand type of thing. Um, anybody that's read Atlas Shrugged will remember Howard Works monologues when he would take over the radio stations and do his pirate broadcasting. And there would be just, you know, it would be, this, these were philosophical treatises that Ayn Rand delivered through the mouth, the mouth of Howard Rourke. Um, or, no, wait, it wasn't Howard Rourke. That was the architect. Who is the guy in Atlas Shrugged? John Galt. John Galt. Was John yeah. Galt. Who is, who is uh, was, John Galt? Yeah. Who is John Galt? So it was John Galt who was doing the monologue. Rourke is the architect and found the John Galt is the, yeah. In yeah. The, the, yeah. Yeah. Resting on my Ayn Rand. But, um, what this is, is this is a literary device. They take a fictional format and then they use it to deliver what I would say is some pretty high level information. If you want to know how things work, like I read through that dialogue a number of times, there were aspects of things that I remember my grandfather talking about in terms of how unions and um, mafia figures and the lodges work together, mm -hmm. the machinery that basically is greased by this entire system. You can see actually a, a really good modern uh, display of this on certain levels would be the t TV show Ozark that shows how yes, like exactly. government, yep. lobbyists, Love that drug show. cartels, uh, yep. financial institutions, all sort of, you know, how it, how it all works. It's, it's, it's a deeply disturbing show, but it's like that, you know, thing you can't stop looking yep, at. I just, finished, I just finished the, the last season of it. Yeah, we're watching it. We're, we're about to start the, uh, last, the awesome. third season. Yeah, yeah, if you haven't seen that, Ozark is... Um... So your points on Ayn Rand like, really brought something interesting up for me. And I think I'm going to hit on that in the, in the second segment because it's going to go into some other things. But I'm glad that you pointed that out because it started this whole line of connections. So we'll get some more into that in the second part. You had some more things here. I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to kind of hit on in this first segment. You had some really cool stuff about um, we well, had this stuff about Admiral, Admiral Byrd's Operation High Jump and, and the book, uh, sorry, in his, uh, his reference to the empty earth. 
Um, and you also had some things about um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Shen with uh, measuring, you know, measuring things with your conscious, you know, like consciousness kind of stuff, water and black holes. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to go into some of this those stuff were, here. Yeah, and that's maybe stuff we can do on the other side of it because any one of those okay. is a topic in itself. So basically, when you, we, this inside the earth concept has a lot of connections, it's interesting because back in before the lockdown, probably in February. I rented Lost Horizon, the 1937 Frank Capra film again. Mm -hmm. And it was right after I had finished reading Inside the Earth. And I wanted to see, given that it was 19, the 1930s, the book was written in 1933, <laughs> go figure, uh, by James Hilton. And um, it was amazing how much they revealed, even in that movie made in that time, about a lost city that basically is like this sort of utopia mm -hmm. carved out of this remote place in, in, in the Himalayas mm -hmm. with this figure that, that's basically like this highly ascended master and how human beings conduct themselves inside of a utopia, uh, basically drawing the pattern that the reason why utopias work is because it's very constrained and there are a limited number of people. And when you bring in outsiders, you bring with them some of the impulses of, of our civilization, which corrupts it. And that's a lot of what gets shown there. And, you know, that gets you to thinking about Operation High Jump and Admiral Byrd, who did both poles. <laughs> and the fact that Byrd was ordered to remain silent about the poles and about what he called hollow earth. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, you take that information, you fold it into Ida Dorpa, and you read these books, and you really can map in your mind kind of a more complete picture about what we're dealing with in terms of the world itself, mm -hmm. of how it's composed, of what it's like when people have journeyed there, I mean, even Jules Verne's journey to the center of the earth touches on some of this. And Jules Verne was, you know, he was, he was a Masonic, uh, he was a Masonic asset. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about, like one of the, this book details something that like, you have to really expand your mind to sort of, you know, for the average person to get their head about, around this. And, you know, we're not even really clear on where we are, where we are, and how it works. Who we are, and how that interfaces with this planet, which sets up, you know, which is sort of a symbolic of every situation we find ourselves in, right? Like there is, there was a, there was like a little paragraph that I wanted to read, if that's okay. Yep. That's from it, it's under a section titled the situation today and i think this goes to what we're talking about here and like well, what we're in right now and why these things are, are are related and what it says here is that some scientists realize that the reality within the planet is different from what current theory supports but if they were to dare present another viewpoint they would be ostracized by the reaction of the scientific community in this way, it seems that one hand is washing the other hand under the tangle of terrible manipulation and a very oppressive control of progress and scientific ideas. Mankind, mankind is actually held under an embargo on the knowledge of reality and scientific ideas. Dr. Shen has repeatedly specified to me that the evidence, in quotes, and measurements regarding the internal structure of the planet only seem to portray a certain reality the one that the scientists want to impose, but the truth is completely different. It has already been demonstrated that the planet, which is believed to be a compact, full-faced planet, might be hollow at its center by reason of the existing data and measurements that have been recorded. Therefore, it is only a matter of interpretation by contemporary scientists who prefer the solid Earth model, even if it exhibits innumerable inconsistencies, and even if it is proven by experimental evidence to be false. Right, and so this exact same 
like little sermon here about the structure of the earth can go to exactly what we're dealing with right now in terms of uh, our current situation with the virus and our yeah, health yeah. And, and, our, and, and our DNA, right? And it's, it's, there's just one more little part here that I wanted to say, right? And it's a, just a paragraph down and it says, avoiding such challenges, scientists do not even want to recognize their own conceptual boundaries nor do they want to abandon the obsolete and horizonless paradigm of materialism, a mindset they seek to maintain desperately in any explanation or scientific hypothesis they express, both on the inner reality of the planet as well as the outer reality. In fact, this curse of a dusty vision has even extended into the quantum domain where phenomena is not understood in terms of the essence of its subtle energy, but rather tends to be interpreted in the spirit of purely materialistic ideas and principles, right? And I mean, think about all the stuff you can do with that. But that's essentially what, I mean, how, we don't understand where we are. We don't understand ourselves. We don't understand how things actually work. And it's not because it can't be known. It's, be, it's because of this sort of chauvinism, of this materialist, materialist chauvinism or whatever, right? They have one idea that they want to impose and those concept, the conceptual boundaries of the authorities have put limits on the individual perception that's seemingly available to, to people, right? I mean, isn't that what this entire fucking charade that we're in right now is? Well, people were hypnotized. Mm -hmm. and, and for the most part, I don't want to sound cool about this. They've chosen that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can know. Yeah. This is a war on consciousness, but it's being fought largely through the offices of human laziness. <laughs> the offices the of in, like and the like inability, the inability of people to be able to objectively look at their own reality. I mean, if you if you walk, if you sleepwalk through this world, it lo looks perfectly normal. But I, and increasingly. I mean, the story of my life is walking through this world and going, none of this is normal. None of this feels right. I don't belong here. What the fuck am I doing on this world? Yep. And the reason for that is this concept that we really are kind of aliens here in, in the sense that our consciousness was forged in another dimension. And this is, goes into, you know, the journey of souls. There's a lot of young, what you would call young souls, souls who do not have, let's just say, uh, a whole lot of uh, wear on the tires yet. <laughs> and it's an incubator of consciousness. But consciousness is how we experience it. And so it doesn't require thousands and thousands of incarnations and lifetimes. It simply requires the curiosity to look around you and challenge the narrative that you're being given, which doesn't make sense if you just look a little bit below the surface of things. It also requires one to have more um, trust and faith in their own experiences and observations than in what the consensus reality or the authorities are saying, right? And, and that's for some people, um, you know, that, like, that feels like a huge leap of faith. It feels much more secure to do what everybody else is doing. So it really is it, it also courage and bravery is what it takes, right? To say, to not, like, like, to me, what I hate most about what's going on right now is I don't like being asked to do things that are dumb, right? And so to acknowledge what your own common sense is at the risk of being ostracized or shouted down by a Karen at the grocery store has become, I mean, it's ridiculous that that's a revolutionary act, right? But that's, like, that's what's going so, on. The consensus reality is, the, it's reflected in the philosophy of the Hegelian dialectic, basically. Yeah. It's a group mentality, it's gang stalking, it's bullying. It's all the crude tactics of social conformity. And you see it play out now in coronavirus because this is a massive um, assault on the social order. They are putting everything under stress and they want everything to be enforced from the top down without question. And so the people who are questioning this reality are no different than the people who are questioning the reality of a 3D world versus a 4D world 
versus the famous 19th century writing about the uh, flat world. Mm -hmm. you see that? You remember the, 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 it was written in the 19th century. It was called Flat World. And then we go that. through the entire riff of years with the flat earth people. Mm -hmm. And there's a consciousness level to all this. Because yeah. when you destroy, we orient by our bodies physically. We are a consciousness inside of, of a body that navigates a temporal space-time continuum. Thoughts influence how we navigate. And when our consciousness is affected by an external event or an, an external stream of data, we, we reprogram on the fly. It's, it's, like, it's like heuristics in, in, in computers. We, re, we just we re, re, reprogram. And so all of this is designed to keep us constantly reprogramming in a loop rather than expanding out. And the point of these books, the, these books ultimately are about the war on emergent consciousness, is, which is what I've been talking about in the Eye of the Needle series, is that this is a war on emergent consciousness. And you'll see that reflected in all of these books, in the dialogues that take place, in the uh, speeches that Cesar Brad and Dr. Jen and Radio Cinema engage in. That's what they're talking about. All right. So do you want to sort of wrap up here and yep. move into I the, all right. all right. So we're going to get going over into the Patreon side of patreon.com forward slash off planet media. And we're going to sort of dig into some of the, um, I don't know if you'd call them technologies or truths about the way physics and metaphysics work inside the earth and uh, connect some of the things going on here and that have been brought back, brought up back to some of our, our old favorite topics. So join yeah. us on the other side. Back for to that. The roots. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, we'll see you guys on the other side. Alrighty. This is off planet radio.